All right, let's move on. You might remember um, the case of Aaron Driver. This was bizarre. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, a lone wolf uh, terrorist sympathizer uh, detonates a device inside the back of a cab. A uh, cab driver flees for his life. Uh, and, of course, police uh, shoot Aaron Driver. Uh, beyond what his uh, it came out in the initial investigation, we haven't really heard much about Aaron Driver. Uh, the investigation, uh, a police investigation, has found that the RCMP were just or uh, found RCMP were justified in fatally shooting uh, Aaron Driver, and that uh, that the force and in, in what they used was uh, substantiated. Which you know, I, I guess do we need an investigation for that? But of course, any time something like this happens involving the police, there is always an investigation. To talk more about all of this, Dave McCormick is with us, Executive Vice President of Business, Business Development Investigative Solutions Network Inc., and is on the line with us now. Hello, Dave. How are you today? I'm well, Scott. How are you? Good. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us. We greatly appreciate this. So, what we're finding out from this yesterday, this was basically an investigation into the actions of the police, correct? That's correct. Into the actions of the RCMP officers on that day. And what were the findings? What can you tell us about this? Well, the findings were, much as you've said, Scott, that the uh, investigative body, which was comprised of a section of the OPP and I believe the Strathroy Police Service, determined that the actions that were uh, utilized by those police officers at that time that ended up with uh, Mr. Driver's demise uh, were reasonable and were in, with, were in line with Section 25 of the Criminal Code, which lays out specifically how much force someone who is tasked with administering justice can use as long as they are using it with reasonable grounds and they use only as much as necessary. If that is the case, then they come back and the, re- the finding is that those, that use of force was justified. So we haven't heard much about uh, other ten, uh, other than this, which again is less is, is more about the police response than it is about driver itself. We haven't heard much about this whole investigation, other than the information that came out at the beginning. Uh, obviously, the suspect was killed because that has happened. Will we find out as much information on his background or where this investigation is going, or was it pretty much over with his demise? How is all that working, and do people keep following? up on this? No, people will definitely keep following up on this. I mean, the RCMP is the lead investigative body in Canada whenever there are acts of terrorism. So despite the outcome on that fateful day in Strathroy, the RCMP will continue to work with its intelligence partners in Canada and abroad to try to figure out exactly what Mr. Driver was up to, what liaison he has made with other terrorist organizations, communiques that he may have had back and forth. Are there any other people that were involved? I know they've said so far, lone wolf. But they will continue to dig, and they will see if he pops up in anybody else's circles and try to connect all of those dots to prevent any further problems down the road. Since he did die in this encounter, will we will the public hear about this, or will this be pretty much behind closed doors and in that type of investigation, an intelligence investigation? No, it is very possible that the RCMP could release certain elements of that investigation. They're not likely to release all of it. And for an analogy, I would say it's exactly what we see in Ontario when the Special Investigations Unit, that uh, independent body of the government, the provincial government that investigates acts of police officers which may be criminal in nature, they don't release the entire report, but sections of the report could be released, and I suspect the RCMP could do that as well. Um do you think that this was, um, is there any reason to believe that this was anything other than an isolated lone wolf uh, uh, situation? Is there anything to believe that there, that this was, there were other people involved, that sort of thing? Based on what I've heard and from my contacts in the policing world, no, they're looking at this as a lone wolf, but they're certainly not going to close the case and say that's what it is. He will always be on their radar based on the actions that he had taken up to and including that day. How dangerous was that encounter? I mean, uh, we heard one device went off. There was a second one in there. The cab driver survived, luckily. Uh, how bad could this have been? Well, this could have been very bad. We could have had a lot of people dead, not only Mr. Driver. Uh, detonating an explosive device anywhere is obviously dangerous to life. Detonating it in a confined space, such as a motor vehicle, could have resulted in the death of other people in that vicinity. So it was a very dangerous situation that obviously gave those officers on scene reasonable grounds to believe that they had to neutralize that threat, that is, uh, stop Mr. Driver in his tracks. And the investigation that we saw by the OPP and by the Strathroy Police Service have, has come out and confirmed that, yes, their actions were necessary to prevent further loss of life, either the cab drivers 
those officers that were on scene or members of the general public. This all started with uh, a call from the U.S. and, and out of the FBI and, and such. Um, how long from the, the time that information is received to the time that these sort of actions are taken? And how much information would our police services have about what is going on? I mean, it's, it's sort of like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it sort of feels like, you know, all of a sudden, boom, this thing comes in your lap and, and you've got to react to it now. That is exactly how it happens most of the time. It's, uh, it, for my information, in this case, it was uh, a very, very fluid situation. The FBI received information which they passed on to the RCMP based on the information that the RCMP received. They obviously believed that this was something that they needed to take action on right away, and they, they put their forces into movement, which ended in what we saw happen in Strathroy that day. As far as the local police of jurisdiction, it's hard to say if the RCMP would have had time to notify them that, A, they were coming into their jurisdiction, B, what they had. I know on a professional uh, respect level, they, they would have made efforts to do that, but sometimes it's just not possible. They, they need to make, get out there as quickly as they possible and stop Mr. Driver from doing what they believed he was going to do, which was commit a terrorist attack somewhere in the downtown core of Toronto. Uh, concerned that this information originated from the U.S., should we have a better handle on this stuff, concerning, considering it's, it's somebody from here? Well, I think we do have a good handle on this stuff. We have to recall, remember that the intelligence world is very, very interwoven. So the Toronto Police Service, the OPP, the RCMP, every police service in Canada has people embedded into different aspects of intelligence, intelligence gathering, and working together in specialized units. So there is a large transfer back and forth of information, information sharing, to ensure that everybody is protected as much as they possibly can be, and that the police services and authorities in those jurisdictions are advised as quickly as possible on a potential threat, and then a, an action plan is then developed and taken, taken to task to ensure that we can neutralize the threat before it happens. Who would be in charge of this situation on the ground there where it all happened? I mean, obviously, you're getting information from the FBI. Then what happens to it once it's coming from the FBI? So who would be in charge of that on the ground at that day? On that day in Strathroy would be an RCMP officer. Right. Not necessarily the most senior RCMP officer or the highest ranking RCMP officer, but that officer that is properly trained as an incident commander, as a terrorist incident commander, in situations like this, he or she would have been in charge, the, the team leader, if you will, to, uh, to move into place and to uh, activate whatever plan they had devised. How uh, different is a scenario like this than others that you would encounter on a day-to-day -day basis? Is this something that our police services need better training for? I think our police services are very well trained on it. And uh, as uh, I think you know, I was involved with policing for 36 and a half years mm -hmm. as an incident commander for many, many of those years in Toronto. Uh, we are highly trained and we do. They are highly trained and they do cross train uh, with other emergency providers and with other police services. I think the training is right up to date. Where we are finding greater difficulties is in trying to learn about these potential lone wolves or these groups before they actually go into action. So it's becoming more and more of a challenge. Uh, to actually identify them and get into place in time. As far as what police encounter on a daily day, yeah, this is a little more uh, serious than that, in that we had an individual who apparently was uh, determined to go to a very populated area in Toronto and detonate a device or commit terrorism in some fashion. So he had a larger group of potential victims, and there was certainly a situation where a lot more people could have been hurt, including police officers, Mr. Driver, and just the general public. So a, li a much higher stake than we see on a day-to-day -day basis Although you, you never know what you're going to face as a police officer when you get into that vehicle in the morning and go to work. Yeah, I, I can imagine what that must be like. I can only imagine what that must be like. I, is it a different, for lack of a better word, is it a different feeling? Is it a different buzz when you go to a call and all of a sudden it's not, again, nothing's normal uh, in your line of work. I, I hope not. But is it different when all of a sudden the threat is something like terrorism? It is different, Scott, because we see it across the world that often these types of attacks, there are more than one explosion or there are more than one person involved, yeah. or there are more elements to it than just that primary scene that you may be at. So you have to be cognizant of that. I mean, if we can look at something uh, like a bank robbery, I'm not minimizing the violence and the, and the mm -hmm. threat in a bank robbery, but if you look at that, essentially it's one or, or possibly a group of people, but they are robbing a singular bank, and then they are leaving. In this case, you don't know what the motive is. You don't know if it's going to be one explosion, two explosions, 
uh, multiple attacks, simultaneous attacks in different parts of the city. You really don't know what you're dealing with. So, yes, when you do respond to something like this, the hair does stand up on the back of your neck because you realize this could be part of an intricate network of things that are about to cause a very bad day. Yeah, it could go from a crime very quickly to a, a mass killing, couldn't it? Oh, absolutely. Uh, what about the cab driver? Many uh, He was vocal when all this went down that somehow he could have been handled better. Is there any way that, that, he could, that more could have been done to protect him in some way? Or is this, like you said, just a fluid situation and, and you do your best? It's a fluid situation. Uh, I, I'm very, very hesitant to sit here and say that the RCMP could have handled it differently. I don't know. I wasn't there. But I can tell you that... Uh, the, the RCMP would have had a tactical de- debrief once everything had settled as to what they do, when did they know it, what did they do about it, and how did they handle the situation at that scene as Mr. Driver exited the house and got into the cab. Could it have been done differently to perhaps create a situation where Mr. Driver didn't have the ability to detonate that device inside the cab while the cabbie was in there? These are all things that they would have looked at and they would then take and try to come up with the best practices uh, procedure flowing from that. I mean, that's that's a normal thing that happens after a major event like this. But I can't sit here and tell you, you know, did they fumble the ball or did they not? Because I wasn't there, and that certainly would not be fair. Uh, this is obviously a new world that we're living in now, Dave. Uh, are and and lots have been said that you know police are being asked to do the work work that military would normally be doing. Uh, how has preparation? How has training changed? to allow for all of this in, in this new world that, that everyone finds themselves living in and that you guys have to defend against? Well, training has actually uh, changed. It's evolved very well. In fact, uh, we see in uh, Toronto specifically, and I'm sure other jurisdictions are doing it as well, there is now a unit that deals with uh, countering uh, extremism. So actually getting to these, these men and women before they uh, actually get radicalized and decide that they're going to take action, how to identify them. So the, this unit works with the community to look for potential problems within their own communities to see if this person may be subject you know, to radicalization, uh, someone who may be prone to uh, joining a group or being inspired by a certain group. So the training actually begins with that, trying to spot the problems before they come. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of cross-training with specialized units. Uh, we have in Toronto and other jurisdictions the CBRNE, uh, so chemical uh, radiation explosives and all other types of hazards, specialized units. We have the emergency task force uh, in Toronto, so much like a SWAT team where they come in with their high-powered weapons to, and able to uh, contain or, or to defuse a situation, uh, eliminate any possible threat that may be there if necessary. There are highly specialized bomb units, and in, in the case of undetonated bombs, yes, the military does come in and usually assist with those as well. If it's a military bomb, a military device in the first place. Uh, the ever-changing world of policing. Uh, Dave McCormick has been with us, Executive Vice President of Biz- Business Development, Investigative Solutions Network, Inc., and obviously former police officer. Dave, thanks for the time and insight. Much appreciated. My pleasure, Scott. Anytime. It 